Beloved and friends, you were made to see not yourself, but Christ. You were made to see not yourself or even the creation, but the creator. And your view of Christ is vital to your worship, to your walk, to your witness. There's nothing more essential, necessary, indispensable to our singing than our viewing, our understanding. So my prayer is that through this series and this message in particular, that we would see Christ, see him in the glory of his resurrection, ascended and seated. We were made for this. I have one aim this morning, and that is to put the exalted Christ before you. One aim, to call every heart, to honor him, to adore him, and to bow to him. One aim, to put the exalted Christ before you to see. That's my prayer and my goal, my aim, my heart's desire. We have seen over the series these last three weeks that the resurrection and the ascension and now the session of Jesus are all part of one grand reality. The exaltation, meaning the lifting high of Christ. It is all part of the exalting of Jesus. Acts chapter 2, this is what the apostles preached. Chapter 2, verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And verse 33 nails it. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. And that's where I want us to look today. Exalted at the right hand of of God. I do believe that the crown of Christ's exaltation is best seen when he's seated at the right hand of the Father. His exaltation, his crowning glory is best seen when he's seated. There's a great deal of stress that's necessary on this idea of him being seated. Perhaps more than any other, it portrays vividly a climactic vindication. He is vindicated from all humiliation in that we see him seated. Being seated is something that is summarized at the close of the Gospel of Mark. 16, 19, it says, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. It's a foundational article of our faith. We just recited it in the Apostles' Creed, that we believe that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and on the third day rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That same stanza of him sitting has been treasured by Christians for 2,000 years throughout their history, in their creeds and confessions and catechisms. The Westminster Catechism says it very well. Question 54 how is Christ exalted in his seating or sitting at the right hand of God? The answer, Christ is exalted in his sitting at the right hand of God in that as God man, he is advanced to the highest favor with God the Father, with all fullness of joy, 
glory and power over all things in heaven and earth. Period. It is the crowning of his exaltation, the crowning of his glory. I want us to notice as we move into the thought of him being seated, as we recall him being resurrected from the dead, ascended into heaven, that we stop for a moment and remember it's all about Christ. These grand realities are first about the giver, not the gift. They're first about him, not us. We were made to see him, not self. Our greatest joy is going to come from seeing greatest glory. We need to first stop and remember the supremacy of Christ in all things. Because that's what him being seated means. Just put it in your hearts. Seated equals supremacy. Seated equals supremacy. It's the supremacy of Christ that I am so interested in. What he does for us is a glorious thing that deserves all praise forever and ever and ever. But what we need to see is that what he does for us in the cross actually enables and causes us to see. It enables and causes us to have joy in his glory. So that our purposes and ambitions, our appetites and cravings are centered and driven in the exalted Christ on making much of him. Christ is our greatest need. I know many of you come in this room with, with tremendous needs, uncertainties, sorrows. Pains and suffering. Worry, doubt. And I know many of you are so occupied and caught up with the things that the world is telling you you need. In your appearance. In your pocketbook. In your health and strength. In your mind and knowledge. In your feelings in your relationships, in your possessions. The world is telling you, no, this is what you need to be happy. No, this is what you need to be happy. Or this is what you need to find comfort. Or this is what you need to feel safe. Or this is what you need to have hope. If I might say it very carefully, but very directly, what every one of us needs is an exalted Christ. What we need is Christ. And that is why my aim is to put it before you. Not because I disregard your need, but because I'm making much of your need. The only satisfaction to your need is found in Christ. But every one of us lives in a 21st century affluent area that is constantly working against your heart, vying for your attention and your affections to love and to be distracted with nonsense and puny, pathetic, temporary lies and false counterfeit delights. And I, my prayer from every one of you is that you see the all-satisfying glory of Christ. That's what I want you to see when you see him seated. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. 
after making purification for sins, he sat down. He sat down. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The thesis of the book of Hebrews is the supremacy of Christ. He is greater and he is better than any and every other thing, even the most holy things of God. It's the supremacy of Christ. And right here we see that supremacy presented in wonderful portrayal. There's a chiasm that I want you to notice just for the sake of seeing what Hebrews is aiming at in talking about this Christ being seated. What it's aiming at is first, the chiasm means it makes like an X, so it crosses down to the middle, it's the main thing, and comes back and corresponds at each point along the way. So the outer bounds, the first and the last, is going to be simply about him being son of man. And you'll notice it right there where it says in verse 2 that whom, so after the whom statement, it begins this chiasm. So in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. So here, here he is, this son of man is, is to inherit the created order. B, so that's A, B stepping in says, oh, but he's not, he's not a creature. No, he will inherit everything. He is high and lifted up, exalted above all created order. He will inherit it all. It is all owing and pointing to him. It is all from him, through him, to him, and for him. But he made it all. So he's not just son of man, he's also son of God. He's not just human, he's deity. So notice deity comes in when it says he created. Through him he also created the world. And now one last step to the very center has two parts to it. And it's simply this. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. I just... Love that. So there's the center of exalting Christ is going to be understand the dignity of his person. This is God. The radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And then he goes back to the created order, doesn't he? Talking about him being God as one who created. Notice what it says now. He didn't just create, but he sustains it says very simply, and upholds the universe by the word of his power. So he created all things by the word of his power, and he upholds it by the word of his power. That's B. Let's go back to A. A was that he's son of man, that he is human also. And here it is. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The exaltation of Christ is seen in the Son of Man, Son of God, exactly God. Now, something to be seen in this idea that he, in the dignity of his person, is the radiance of the glory of God. I love the idea that God is described as invisible spirit who dwells in unapproachable light. You can't see him. You know, it makes perfect sense to say that Jesus is the radiance. Because you see radiance. Oh, do you know that not one of you has ever seen the sun? You think you've seen it. All you've seen is the radiance. In fact, it's the only way to see the sun is to see the radiance of it. It's the only way you can see the sun is by seeing its radiance. And the radiance is actually the same exact substance as the sun. But the radiance comes from the source to you. 
does anyone see a parallel? Nobody's seen God. But Christ is the radiance, the exact substance who comes to you. In fact, the whole point that he's getting at is, well, God revealed himself. He revealed himself. He showed himself through other means in the past. But now he's shown himself by the radiance of the same substance of himself. I think that's beautiful. What we have then is that Christ is a representative of God, but don't miss this. Christ is God representing God. And you have that nowhere else. You were made to see the glory of God. And it's in the face of Christ. He is the radiance. He is the glory. Oh, but notice this in verse 8. I, I think there's one last thing we have to see. I would love to talk more about this, but, but I, I must move on. But you've got to see this because this just took me just about off my chair completely. And that is the thought. Just give thought to this. It's important when we see things in Scripture, what it says and calls others. It's another thing when Scripture is declaring what God says about another. Look at verse 8. But of the Son, God the Father says, Your throne, O God. Who does God call God? Christ. God calls Christ God. And that's the essence the center, the indispensable core of the dignity of his person. And wrapped around that is the humanity of him being the son of man who through his faithful, obedient life and suffering and sacrifice, he is the heir of all things and he made purification for sin and now alone is qualified to sit down. That's the point. I want to stress this little bit before I move into the actual uh, observation of the, him being seated, and that is we've looked now at him being exalted, that he, the, the, the core of his person is God, and yet he is God-man, and man is what is being exalted, not the God part. His deity is not being exalted. You can't exalt deity higher than deity. So that's not being exalted when he sits. It's the man part that's being exalted when he sits. It's the obedient servant part. It's the suffering Messiah part that's being exalted. when It's the representation of humanity part that's being exalted when he sits. My point is, he is the mediator. And we've looked at that in both resurrection and ascension. But I want to just remind us once more, he is the mediator. Christ's enthronement is not merely a reinstatement of, of what is his by right of deity, but it's actually an enthronement for the first time in history. That's why the scriptures say, that's why Hebrews says, today I have begotten you. Because it's the enthronement is the ratification, the confirmation, the open public declaration that he is God-man and the one who has secured redemption and reconciliation cosmically. So the issue is, this is a celebration. It's a celebration that celebrates the joy and the reward of his accomplished redemption, his work of redeeming. It is an installment of a mediatorial representative. He and he alone represents humanity to God and he and he alone represents God to humanity. He is the radiance that we see and he sits next to the father so that when the father looks upon all humanity in him, they see 
perfect, God sees perfection. He is the mediatorial representative, sharing in both natures, representing to both. He's glorious. Hodge said it this way, the right hand of God denotes the official exaltation of the, media, of the mediator to supreme glory, felicity and dominion over every name that is named. Bavink says this very well, the office and work of the, media, of the mediator could only be accomplished by one who has, was both true God and true man. By his resurrection and ascension, Christ enters a new state. As the mediator, he is now at the right hand of glory. Though he was truly God in his state of humiliation, the glory was hidden. That's the key. So we finally have reached from the empty tomb to the ascension to heaven. We finally reached the goal of it all. And that is that he be recognized, that he be exalted and honored And that not only all the humiliation reversed, but a celebration of joy and praise be lavished upon him. He is worthy. Before we get into him being seated, I thought it might just be a little bit helpful to notice something else here in Hebrews. (laughs) It's a striking thing. God ordained three offices by which God would mediate to his people. Notice I said Jesus is the the, the mediator. So we should expect that he would fulfill all mediatorial offices. And those three offices that God ordained to mediate his rule and his will to humanity because sin has separated us, those three offices are very simple. Prophet, priest, and king. Now look with me one more time. Chapter 1, verse 1 of Hebrews. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in this, these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, the greater prophet. How about this? Verse 3 at the end. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. Purifications for sin, priest. Above all priests. And he sat down at the right hand of majesty, king, above all kings. Right here, prophet, priest, king. This is Christ in his glory. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time just looking at what does it mean that he's seated and how can you see that as something that speaks of his supremacy and his glory, that that would compel you, that would move you, that you would worship and honor and adore him. Well, I want to look at what it means for Christ to be seated. Sessio in Latin means to sit. By the way, that's where you get the word session. So anytime you have a session, it means you're seated. What we see here is this, that the resurrection, that the ascension are all means, not ends, but means to a greater end. And the greater end is that he's seated. These serve to make much of him being seated. The resurrection and ascension are the red carpet rolled out. The session is the celebration. Now he is seated on the throne. It is a state of exaltation. It is a state of supremacy. It is a state deserving of all worship and fear. Now, it says right hand, and that's something that's going to be repeated over and over and over. At the right hand, at the right hand, at the right hand. And I just thought it would be important for us to understand exactly what does this right hand mean. Well, it's simple. It means the place of highest dignity, honor, authority, power, rule, and judgment. The right hand was the place of special honor. Plummer says it well. To a higher degree of rest, rule, bliss, favor, power, and majesty, Christ could not be raised. In this glorious state, Jesus Christ executes all the mediatorial offices. The right hand is the hand 
of execution of all that God does. Notice also it speaks of equality. You know, I mean, just put it this way. He's not seated above or below. He's not seated before or behind. He's seated beside. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, when there was a conflict between Paul, this Johnny-come-lately apostle, and Peter and John and James over in Jerusalem. And the established apostles were saying, wait a second, what is, this, what is Saul doing out there? Is this a trick? So Paul goes and visits with them, and he lays it out, and he shows them his heart for Christ. And you know what it says they did? They gave him the right hand of fellowship. What did that mean? And Paul writes that with joy in his heart to the Galatians. Look, I've got the right hand of fellowship with Jerusalem. It means I've been given equal partnership in the, in the message of the gospel, in the ministry of the church. So there's an aspect where right hand speaks of an equality. In fact, I'll just illustrate it one other way. I find it fascinating that uh, Ephesians 1.20 says that the Father seated Christ at his right hand. I find it fascinating because most of the time it says that Christ sat himself at the right hand. Let me give you that one then. Right here in our verse, verse 3, what does it say? After he made purification for sins, he what? He sat down. Can you imagine the audacity of you walking up and just, I'm going to sit down right there in the place of all power and authority and equality with God. But this Christ does. Here's, here's my point. If he sat down, and it means the same thing that the Father sat him there, it says something of equality. That the Father sat him, I think, is a stamp of audacious approval. That's my son. He sits there. He puts him there. But this son has the authority to sit there. Oh, that's so good. I'm so excited. It also speaks of authority, right hand. It speaks of authority, power, rule, judgment. Like Revelation 13 associates with the throne, power and great authority. So Christ is seated not merely in a place of highest honor, not merely is he seated, but he's on a throne, and not merely is he seated as though to rest, but he's seated to rule and to judge. Supremacy is the key. So if he, or Acts chapter 5, it summarizes this way. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. Acts 5, 31. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior. Just translate that word leader is RK, which means head, which means all authority, sovereign rule, Lord. So, and that's the typical play on terms throughout the book of Acts. It's always in that order, Lord and savior. So I want to give that to you, Lord and Savior, really because there are two primary aspects, glorious facets to this diamond of the exalted Christ. Two, when he's seated, two of them beam with light. There are others, but these two are the predominant and dominating features. And they are these, that he is seated as a satisfying or priestly satisfaction. That's what it means to Christ. And not only priestly satisfaction, but it also means to Christ that he rules sovereignly acknowledged as king. Let's look at those one at a time. Our purpose is to gaze upon and enter into that celebration of Christ being exalted, his supremacy, the apex of the glory of the risen Christ. And here's how we, I want us to look at it. What does it mean to him? What does it mean to him that he's seated? Number one, 
It means to him priestly satisfaction. It means to him the honor and the dignity and the glory and the rule that he has satisfied. Priestly call to mediate between holy God and a sinful people. I don't know if you noticed, but there's no priest here. Have you noticed that? Of course you have. There's no priest. There's no priest. (laughs) Because there's only one who makes mediation for sinners. And he's seated at the right hand of the Most High. Now, I want to just ask you to think about this being seated. I love the, 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 I'm going through and looking at the tenses and thinking, this is phenomenal. Like the way they describe, the way God describes Christ being seated is described in, in such powerful terms, like in Colossians chapter three, when it says, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, remember this, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What's interesting about that is it's describing that he is seated right now and he's ongoing without cessation will continue forever being seated like that that's what that tense tells me but then there's another tense in hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 and in that tense it says this that for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And that tense says that it's done in the past. He has been seated as though completed in action with everlasting results. So when he took the seat, it was done. Like it is finished. And taking the seat means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. There are consequences to him taking the seat. And the last tense that I want to share with you is right here in Hebrews. Turn with me to chapter 8 and notice how glorious. We're going to look through Hebrews in a number of ways to see how priestly satisfaction is what it means to Christ for him to be seated. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. I love it when scripture just, you know, just lobs you one. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. So it's an important point, right? We have such a high priest, and this is an odd thing, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not in man. I love that. We have a high priest, one who is seated. Now jump back with me to chapter 6. Look at verse 19. I'm sorry, let's go. Back all the way to 5. 5 verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Ooh, that's good. Remember the you are my son today I've begotten you is a statement of the celebration of his enthronement. It's when he sat that the father was so pleased to say this. He already said you're my son at the baptism. He said you're my son at the transfiguration. He already said he's my son. What does it mean then? It means right here I want the whole universe to tremble that this is me as as though my son, as though a part of me right here, seated, who has taken on flesh, now seated as a priest. Oh, look at chapter 6, verse 19 now. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Hebrews six nineteen, A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtains. This is what I mentioned last week when I, when I shared how Through the crucifixion, Christ, as though it were, takes his own blood and enters into heaven through the ascension to render the sacrifice in the Holy of Holies. This is what it's describing. Verse 20, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And now let's go to chapter 9. Hebrews 9, 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest 
of the good things that have come. Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he, Christ, entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And drop down to verse 24. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. What he's saying is the holy of holies, the whole economy of sacrifice, the temple, everything, the lamb, all of it was just a copy, was a sketch, a flannel graph to tell the story of the real thing that was going to happen. And the real thing happened on Calvary. And the real thing of the priest happened when he ascended and brought it into the presence of the Father. And the real thing was finalized when he sat down. So it says, verse 25, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have to had suffer had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. You, you see the logic. A priest comes in with blood. The blood is from an innocent animal, one who didn't sin, but an animal nonetheless. And the blood would be sprinkled for the forgiveness, the atonement, the reconciliation of the sinner. But the priest sprinkles with a stained hand. His need to be forgiven too. But this Christ has come with no defilement. And we know that because he sat down. Watch. But as it is in the middle of 26... He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. One more, chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 11. And every priest. Now, I want to ask you to note this. Please take note of two words. The first word, stands. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered, here's coming up on our second, for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down. Sat down at the right hand of God. Now let's just walk through this. Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the high priest from the descendancy of Aaron, takes the blood of the atonement sacrifice. And the only person in the whole world who was allowed to go through the veil into the Holy of Holies, takes the blood, goes into the veil one time, once a year, sprinkles it for the atonement of the nation. So sacrifice had to happen every year. And a high priest would sin and need his sins forgiven. And so, in fact, because he's a sinner, they used to tie a rope to him and they put bells on his belt and some on the tassels. Because if he was struck dead before the holy, nobody would go in to get him. So they had a rope to pull him out. That's how serious this was. That's once a year. You have to do it every year, once a year, standing and only standing. But that's not only that. There were also seasonal. There were seasonal sacrifices, so certain harvest sacrifices. 
And so in the season, sometimes you'd have two in a year where you would sacrifice according to the season. Then, then there was also monthly sacrifices that would be offered up, very particular sacrifice. Then there, then there were weekly sacrifices, had to be done every week. But, but then there were daily sacrifices. You had to sacrifice every day. Oh, but that's not enough. You had to sacrifice in the morning and you had to sacrifice in the evening. And then beyond the scheduling of all these repeated sacrifices, there had to be a sacrifice for an event, a sacrifice for a sin that had occurred. Josephus tells us that there were over 250,000 lambs slaughtered in the span of two days during Passover. The priests are standing because a priest has no time to sit. The priest's work is never done because people continue to sin. And the issue is sacrifice after sacrifice every year, every season, every month, every week, every day, twice a day, every sin had to be atoned. Every single time, 250,000 lambs did not have enough blood to wash away the sin of the people. And this one priest drops one blood and he sits down for the first time in history. It was done. Sin was atoned, never to be repeated. There's no need for a priest. He's it. He sat down because his was the only true atoning blood. The blood of bulls and goats would never take away sin. But this Christ, my Savior, he brought perfect blood for me. And he laid it down and said, I'll be his mediator. Not only the sacrifice, but also the mediator. Not only the one who died for me, but the one who serves as a priest for me, the one who satisfies every demand of holiness for me, the one who is satisfied by sitting down. There were no seats in the temple, but this Christ sat down. Isn't that what our verse says? Verse 3, Hebrews 1, 3. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, when he sat down again, let me stress it one more time. It wasn't to rest. It was to reign. It was to rule. And you know the first thing that he does when he rules, when he sits down to, rest, or to, to reign and to rule? It, it says, oh, the first, the first priestly item on his, on his mind, as a, as a priest who rules, he's satisfied atonement. He's satisfied the priestly office. He's fulfilled it. And his first rule is to send to you and to me the Holy Spirit. Mark it down, Acts chapter 2. This is what Peter preached. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. Notice that important connection. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Then he says, well, that's being poured out on us. That, that's what you see. In other words... What the grammar teaches is that Christ had to be seated before he would send the Spirit. And why is that? Well, in fact, he said in John 16, 7, he says that I must go, and it's to your advantage if I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And why is that? Well, Peter already said, because the Holy Spirit was the promise of the new covenant. And did you know that the new covenant is the only covenant of God made whereby 
there's the promise of forgiveness. So the new covenant was ratified and completed when the priest gave the atoning blood and sat down. Now the new covenant was given. Now the new covenant promises were given and the son received from the father all authority to say, now I command as I sit, I command the spirit to go and he will intercede on my behalf. That's a priestly work. But there's more. Did you think there might be more? There's more. Look at this. Um, We've looked at chapter 8 already, verse 1 and 2. Let's jump over to chapter 7 now. So he's seated as a priest. He's seated as a high priest, the only one in history. But now chapter 7, notice this connection. Verse 17. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath. By the one who said to him, now think about this. The writer of Hebrews is making a big deal that God made an oath about Christ being a priest. Look what it says. Verse 21, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. Verse 24, but he, Christ, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Resurrection, ascension, seated, everlasting consequence. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who, was, who has been made perfect forever. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point in what we are trying to say or what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. I want you to look at one other thing just to notice some other detail about this. Being seated as a priestly satisfaction to Christ, I want you to see something glorious here. Chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things. Here's my phrase. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Beloved and friends, listen. Do not picture the intercession of Jesus Christ. Do not picture an anxious, sort of desperate, pleading Jesus, worried about if the Father will hear him or not. Don't picture Jesus as anxious and pleading. That's not how he intercedes. In fact, let me just say it this way. Christ intercedes like none else. No one can intercede like he intercedes. Because every other intercession is an intercession that points to a different source. That pleads to a different cause. He pleads our case, watch this, by his presence. You know, the scripture never shows him pleading with the father after his exaltation. 
All it describes is that you have a great high priest interceding on your behalf because he's seated. Are you with me? Okay, that's crazy. What it, what it means, and, the, and reformers have, have, I wish I could just read to you a ton of things. They've described this so wonderfully and beautifully that the issue is it's his presence that effects intercession. It's done. He's not pleading. He's sitting. He's seated. And him being seated is enough. I love the way John puts it. First John chapter two, verse one. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Do you feel the weight of that? But if anyone does sin, if any Christian does sin, if anyone saved by the blood of the Lamb does sin, listen, we have an advocate, and the only thing he says is he uses this great little word, who's with the Father. He's there, seated, and it's enough. When the Father looks upon you, he sees his Son, and it's enough. You see, he's seated as a priest, as though one endowed with unthinkable authority and power and righteousness. And that's really the issue, righteousness, which I, I want to mention in just a moment. You know, it reminded me as I was thinking about this, how the priest in his presence will intercede. Do You know, in the old covenant, well, the high priest had to have on his breastplate the names of the tribe. The names of the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember that? And what was that all about? He bears them as he stands in the presence of God. He bears their name. And that's the idea. As this high priest sits in the presence of the Almighty, he bears your name. He is your representative. And he's perfect. What does it mean to Christ? Well, he is the delight of his father, and his father delights for him to sit with him. What does it mean to Christ? It means that now he can intercede for all that he purchased with no more work. He sits, and his presence intercedes. He is perfectly righteous, and forever and ever he needs to do nothing else to atone. All he does is represent what he's already done. That's amazing. He's endowed with all authority, for he is the God-man, mediator, Messiah. He has been resurrected from the dead, conquered death, because he's taken away the cause of death, the sin, and therefore he forever intercedes. He always prevails because no claim has anything on him. And he alone intercedes before the Father. He alone is our intercessor. Let me just ask you a simple thought about what do you, how do you respond to that? That what does it mean to Christ? It means he's, he's priestly satisfaction is it's there. It's done. He's satisfied. He sits. He celebrates that. So I ask you, if that's what it means to him, how should you feel? How should you think? How should you live? I mean, do do you struggle? Do you struggle with sin? Do you struggle with doubt and assurance? Do you struggle with the fear of God? Do you struggle thinking, I'm doing this, I'm trying. I'm trying to say no. And I'm trying to do what you tell me. I'm trying to read. I'm trying to go to church. I'm trying to pray. And I just, I keep trying. What is it going to take for you to be satisfied? My son. My son. I'm satisfied in my son. So where's your heart? Is it motivated by you trying to satisfy You trying to atone. You trying to do a priestly work. Or are you motivated and compelled by a view of the one who loved you? 
My prayer is that you would get that. One last verse on this. How in the world does this clock go so fast? One last verse. Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that. It's not just the cross. It's not just the cross. More than that. Who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And therefore, the logic is, what can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Can anything? Answer, no. In his exalted state, his presence in this world would mean only judgment. You know that? Have you ever thought about that? John the Apostle fell as a dead man out of fear of seeing the exalted Christ. If Christ did not ascend, if he was exalted right now in this place, it would mean death and judgment and bodies. That's what it would mean. So it's a grace of God that he is seated with all things under his feet and graciously interceding for us. And I just, this one thought captivated me. This one thought just amazed me. Here is the one with all authority and all power and all justice and law on his side to condemn us. And instead, he sits to intercede for us. Isn't it ironic that the one with all authority, the the point of his pinnacle apex exaltation is where he says, I intercede for you. That's where he would judge us the most. What does it mean to Christ? Well, not just his mission, but the fulfillment of the priesthood and the guarantee of satisfaction of every mediatorial means that God has ever ordained. My last point, I'm going to have to go very quickly with this, but I think I can. Kingly, kingly supremacy. Priestly satisfaction, kingly supremacy. And this is really the point, all the way back in Hebrews 1, 3. The point really is, it's not that the priest functioned. There was no precedent for a priest to sit. The point is that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high because he's the king. So the real issue is that this is for the first time a priest king. If I had time, I would take you through to show that God sanctioned the house of David for kings and the house of Levi for priests, and they weren't to cross. In fact, Samuel rebukes Saul and says, you disobeyed the command of the Lord and you will, he'll take the kingdom away because you offered a sacrifice like a priest. Or Isaiah going to Uzziah, the king who became proud and who came into the temple to offer sacrifice like a priest. And Isaiah said, don't do that. You are the king. You are not the priest. And the other priest came with him, the high priest of the day, and many other men of valor came in, and he said, don't do that. And he was struck with leprosy, a statement of being defiled and unclean and unworthy to act as a priest, and he died from it. It's interesting then that... uh, Psalm 110, if I had more time, I would take you there. I'd love to show you how in Psalm 110, it it says these two things in verse 1 and then later in verse 4, where it says, sit at my right hand. You're the king. Verse 4, I say to you today, you are my son. You will be a priest. In fact, that's what Hebrews was quoting. It's an oath, a strong oath, because that's unthinkable to the Hebrew mind. Kings would die to play the priest. If they played the priest. So the point is, Psalm 110 says, no, no, no. The Messiah is going to be both. He'll be the king and he'll be the priest. According to the order of Melchizedek. Oh, that makes sense. Melach in Hebrew means king. Tzadik means righteous. Melach Tzadik means the king of righteousness. Oh, and that makes perfect sense because this Messiah was to be the king of righteousness. And I would give you one last reference. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 9 to 14. Maybe you can read it and you can see there that the prophet 
prophesied ahead of time that the Messiah, who's called the branch, is going to actually be a priest. He's a king who will come into the temple and set up a throne and he'll sit on it. And Revelation 22 says, yeah. And then I saw the throne of God and of the throne of the lamb in the temple. I saw it. I saw it. Beloved and friends, I just need to close us with this idea of seeing the resurrected, glorified, seated Christ. There's much more we could look at in Ephesians where he talks about him being seated above all power, rule, and authority. We can look at 1 Peter 3 where it says, He has gone into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. And here's my issue. Because he's seated... It's a statement of his calm, in control reign. He's not anxious. He's not worried about the war in Ukraine. He's not worried about the economy or the presidency or the politics of the United States of America. He's not worried about the rising power of China. He's not worried about the academic system. He's not worried about our health problems. He's sovereign over them all. He is seated. And our view of him needs to take this into account. That all things exist. And that all that happens or has ever happened is moving through time toward that climactic hour when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow either by will or by compulsion that Christ is seated on the throne. And what we need to take into our hearts today is that sense of everything, everything, everything is under his sovereign rule and command. We need to take the idea that not a single hair on your head falls without him knowing. Not a sparrow falls without him knowing. Not a microbe is outside of his kingly rule. Particulate realities that we have not yet discovered all obey him. There's not one undiscovered force or factor, cause or purpose or means that is not under his perfect and exacting and detailed and specific sovereign control. Governments and courts and militaries and nations and schools and banks and politics and elections and nuclear war and and terrorism and, and world religions and cults and atheism and universities and education systems and quantum physics and technology, sickness, terrorism, world religions, false teachers, demonic opposition, racism, education, economics, ecologies, weather, disease, Again, judicial corruption, school and public shootings, political negotiations, industry, transportation, science. All of it is under Christ who is seated. All of it. And what we need to do, and I'm not just here as an emotional charge. I'm really, really not. My purpose and my aim is simply this. That until you see that, you will be worried You will struggle. You will sin. You will think lightly of offending him. And this will be a game. Enough so that you can walk out of here five minutes later and go indulge yourself in nonsense that will mean nothing in a hundred years. This is the king. Do you believe it? Do you believe this, this faith that we have? is not about us seeing ourselves. It is us seeing the exalted Christ, the glory of the risen Christ. It changes everything. Everything. Beloved and friends, don't fear only him. Fear nothing but him. So if you are not in Christ, this is a time for you to repent. This is a time for you to know, despite all appearances, he's in control. 
and he will judge the living and the dead. And if you're in Christ, fear only him. What can man do to you? What can a virus do to you? What can economy do to you? What can a tyranny do to you? Fear him. One last verse. Don't just fear. Love and adore him. Treasure and cherish him. And be filled with hope and joy. For my God says, through David, who knew of the coming Messiah, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Come to him. Adore him. Your view is vital. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. For revealing yourself in your Son. Apply these things to our hearts for Christ's glory, for the everlasting joy and hope of each one in Him. Amen.